Lord, thank you that we can be in this time this afternoon, listening to your word and thinking through our beliefs in another way. I pray for Paul here this afternoon that you would speak through him, that his uh, message that he's giving here will be very clear to our minds and that we will be open to what you want to say to us. Um, help us to, to think through this topic in a biblical way and be able to um, have right theology, right beliefs when it comes to gender and the way we look at uh, ourselves. Thank you for this time. Amen. Okay, so I <clears throat> really appreciated what um, Elijah shared yesterday, um, and I, so my phone wants me to set a consistent bedtime for better sleep, which is not helpful at the moment. There we go. Um, I really appreciated his um, his whole his whole talk, but the the element of um, thinking and and right right thinking in that in that section, and he emphasized the importance of allowing the Bibles. That he talked about the resurrection and uh, the importance of letting the Bible's story and the Bible's theology impact our present life, our everyday life, like the real parts of life, in such a way that really those two elements that Elijah talked about in his talk, this the sort of you know, re discipleship relationship and thinking theology are actually not two separate things, but they converge because ultimately the Bible is about the, 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 the reason why we think through stuff in the Bible is so that we can love and so that we can uh, enjoy and so that we can worship, right? So somehow they, I was asked to talk about gender roles. And of course, I like you guys can are all being very polite right now, but... There's some of you, maybe most of you, are like when you hear the, the phrase gender roles, the only rolling that you're thinking of is your eyes rolling, right? Because this is just, you're just like, this is boring, right? <laughs> right? You know, I know exactly how this talk works. It's sort of a pre program talk. You hear about, you hear every once, every couple of years at church, someone feels the need to like have the, the talk on gender roles, and it's like, eh, right? And, right? I mean, like, we can be honest. That's kind of how it is. And um, what's worse, I think, is that. It's not only boring, can be boring, but it's also uncomfortable because uh, as much as we maybe don't want to admit it, um, all of us are impacted by society at large, right? And so some of the things that we know the Bible says about men and women, uh, we, because we just live and breathe in, in our world today, we don't really like it because it seems sort of um, uncool or regressive or something like that, right? And so we sort of, uh, we sort of cringe and it's not, we don't, it's, it's doesn't feel like a progressive cool thing to talk about. Uh, but I want to suggest to you that um, we, it's, it's really important thing for us to think about, but I want to, I want to, I want to look at it in the slightly different, from a slightly different perspective. Um, I'm not going to start uh, in the New Testament because I think to have a full-orbed picture and vision of what um, the Bible says about gender, gender roles, men and women, their relationship uh, to each other, we have to see it, we have to zoom out and see it in light of the big picture of the storyline of the Bible. And this is important, this topic is important for multiple reasons, not just for, not just for one. So it's, it's important, yes, that we sort of can practically apply um, sort of the doc know what we believe about gender roles and practically apply them in the church and in the home and that sort of thing. Yes, um, it's important also because um, that we think through this stuff so that we, we can understand how to relate to the people in society and the current issues out there and that sort of thing. But I think even more so, it's important because men and women and their relationship to each other really is a picture and a display and maybe even a theater, a piece of theater for something much grander and greater. And so this is not something that's irrelevant to us if we're not married and we never get married, as I'm gonna spend some time talking about. Um, this is something that's relevant for all of us wherever we are in our lives because every single one of us 
as male and female and in whatever marital state we find ourselves in play some role in the great drama that male and female relationships represent, okay? So let's start, and if some of you have heard me talk before and you know that I tend to start whatever I talk about in Genesis, right? So here we go, this is gonna be no exception. So let's, let's go to Genesis, the very beginning of Genesis. You know, it's interesting, in Genesis chapter three, right after Adam and Eve eat the, uh, the forbidden fruit, um, there's these, God pronounces judgments and curses. And in Genesis 3, 16, he speaks to the woman and he says, I will, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. And he says, you, your desire shall be for or against your husband and he shall rule over you. Uh, so right here, right after this, uh, this eating of the, of the fruit, the sin, God gives a sort of cryptic foretelling that from then on, the relationship between men and women would be fraught with attempts to dominate and to subvert each other. <laughs> sure enough, right? Today in mainstream society, um, we are trying, mainstream society is trying very hard to push back against men's harmful domination of women, right? Uh, and some of that is necessary, some of that's good. In the process, unfortunately, it's also seeking to subvert and obliterate any unique leadership role that men may have, right? Then in our, in our own conservative church culture, we have tried to be faithful to scripture's teaching on the distinct roles of men and women, and this is good, this is commendable, this is right, and this is necessary. Our weakness, though, I think, is that, is that we often tend to first think of each other as men versus women instead of first as fellow humans, and then secondly, men versus women. And I think this can lead to a, a subtle subconscious devaluation of women and an overemphasis on an un unhealthy way on male authority. And as, as we are going to see, I very much believe in the distinct gender roles and, uh, and stuff that, that we uphold. But I think it's really important to, to, get the, to, to get the story right so that it unfolds in a healthy, healthy way. So let's start right at the beginning. At the dawn of creation, God declares his intention to create a very special creature. And this creature is called humans. So look in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. God says, let us, made, let us make man, let us make humans, humankind, in our image, according to our likeness, and let him, them, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The role of humans is to rule over the newly created world, right? And uh, they, are, they are to represent God to creation, and they are to love and to submit to God as their high king. Now, we read in this, in this text that there are two, two types of humans, right? Male and female. But it's, it's explicitly clear from the text that both have the exact same calling. They are both equally God's image on the earth. Both of them are fellow rulers over creation. It's not males, men who are creation's rulers. It's humans. You see that? This is, this is right in the text, right? This is, um, he created man. Well, what does that mean? Male and female. And God gave them dominion. We see this truth in the New Testament as well with reference to the new creation, to redemption. So Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, instructs, his hu instructs husbands to care for and to honor their wives. Why? Because he says they are fellow heirs of the grace of, of life. This is what Paul says in Galatians where he says, in the Messiah, there's no Greek and, and Jew, there's no slave or free, there's no male and female. Paul was not saying, well, there are no gender distinctions anymore. 
right? He was not saying that that passage has been twisted by, by lots of liberals to say, well, see, there's no gender distinctions. There's no difference in leadership roles or anything like that. Well, Paul obviously doesn't mean that because he, all over the other, in many of his other writings, he, he still thinks that there are such, such distinctions. But what he means is that one's standing with, with God, one's participation in, the, in eternal life, in the life of the age to come, in the new creation that he says is breaking in uh, in Galatians, has nothing to do with one's gender. The calling of redeemed humans is just like the calling of the first humans. Humans, men and women alike, are inheritors of the new earth through Jesus the Messiah. So it, wherever, else, wherever else we go, it must not be ever forgotten that everything else the Bible says about men and women and their relationships is built on this this foundation, right? We're humans first, equally made in the image of God with the same calling. Now, for a twist. Genesis 1 and 2 are kind of interesting because they sort of tell the story of creation or parts of it like twice, right? And um, this is sort of common in, in, uh, in ancient Hebrew literature to kind of repeat stuff. And really what's going on is sort of Genesis 2 is like a zoom in on Genesis 1. So you're like, you're like, what is this? You sort of double click it and it like, meow, and that's just Genesis 2. So uh, Genesis 2 is giving you the zoom, uh, zoom in perspective on how the verses we just read, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, unfold in real time. So what we read is what looks like the beginning of a, beautiful, a beautifully choreographed dance. What do we see in Genesis 2? We have this male human that's created first from the dust, and then the female human is created out of the man's side. This is a sign that she is the same as he is, right? Because like Adam was like going around and just like naming all the animals, and he's like, uh-oh. You know, this is all cool, but there's, there's, no, there's no like, there's no one corresponding to me. This is sort of a problem. And then when the woman shows up, he's like, oh, thank God. Um, that is essentially what he says. This, <laughs> this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, right? He's like, oh, finally. Um, so, uh, so, so there, she's the same as he is, but the way she's created in relationship to him hints that the two may play slightly distinct and different roles, right? They are indeed to be fellow rulers, but Adam is a king, and Eve is his queen. There's a special responsibility and an accountability that rests upon the king's shoulders to ensure that, that their realm is protected and cared for and for him to make sure that his queen is protected and cared for. Now, Eve, and by implication sort of all wives, uh, is often referred to as a, as a helpmeet, right? We've heard this exceedingly unhelpful phrase. Um, so this phrase has taken on a life of its own uh, since its original use in 17th century English, right? Um, what it actually, what it meant and what it means a much, that, that, that was a good rendering at the time, uh, but it's not really, or it's an okay rendering, but it's not really good right now because it sort of obscures what, what the text means. Um, it's better, I think, to say a, uh, a helper corresponding to him, right? I think that's, that's a better rendering of the Hebrew for now, for our contemporary use. And that's what help meet means, a helper who's fit for him, who's make, who fits with him. And again, this is in the backdrop of the animals, right, who clearly are not a fit, good fit for him. They don't correspond to him. They're not his type. Um, but I think, I, I think it can become e dangerously easy to think of women as fundamentally existing as men's servants, okay? But in Genesis 3, when God sort of says that, that the man needs a helper corresponding to him, um, he's not thinking that Adam needs some helper to do his laundry. I mean, I guess he had no laundry at the time. So <laughs> there's that. But uh, he, he's, he's not thinking that Adam needs a maid 
to do his work for him, right? The woman is not created to be Adam's personal servant. The woman is created as his equal who would be able to come alongside him and help him in their common calling to rule the world. They are indeed corresponding to each other. Both are equally made in God's image, but King Adam needed a queen by his side to help him rule. Do you see that? It may seem a subtle distinction, but I think it's, it can have some pretty big implications in how we relate to each other. There's a sense of authority and submission right in Genesis 2 between Adam and Eve. Um, Adam was created first with special responsibility, and Eve was created as Adam's companion to share his mission. God had given Adam directions about which tree to avoid. Adam was the one who named the animals, right? So there's a special, special sense of, of authority that he seems to have. But there is no sense of either Adam domineering Eve nor of Eve being sort of subjected to Adam in sort of a, a slave way, right? They were king and queen. So in creation, we see two fundamental truths. First are that all humans men and women alike are made as God's representatives under him to rule the world, okay? That's, that's first, and it must stay first. Second, males and females play distinct roles as kings and queens, respectively, right? Adam and subsequent husbands and males have a special responsibility on his, on his shoulders to ensure that humanity's calling to care for, to protect, to rule the world according to God's direction would be fulfilled. And also Adam and subsequently husbands and males later on have a uni- had a unique responsibility to ensure that Eve and subsequent females are well protected and cared for. Eve and subsequent females, wives, shared in the common human calling, but Adam needed a queen to come alongside him to help him to fulfill God's calling for them both. And this is, how, this is how this beautiful dance was supposed to work. And it would be quite a stunning dance, don't you think? Unfortunately, now we're back at Genesis 3, right? And we sort of previewed Genesis 3 earlier when we read that verse. And this is not cool because what happened? The dance unraveled. Uh, in fact, as Paul later suggests in 1 Timothy 2, the fall took place at least in part because the king and queen got their steps mixed up. And since then, the beautiful kingly and queenly roles have, have gotten skewed. Kings became tyrants and thought of their queens as slaves, and queens tried to become kings or tyrants themselves and push their kings aside, right? And this is sort of the history of men and women since then, right? So, how does Jesus fit into this? Well, I could say a lot of this, the intervening time between Genesis 3 and and the coming of Jesus, but let's zoom, let's sort of fast forward. Jesus came to redeem fallen humanity, but he came, he's presented as coming as a groom to rescue a bride, The true king came for a queen. Jesus is the new Adam coming for his new Eve, the church, all of us. And as we read in Ephesians 5, he laid down his life for his bride. In so doing, Jesus has brought a new clarity, a new beauty, and a new dignity to the relationships between husbands and wives, and by implication, there's trickle-down effects to males and females, you know, more generally. Wives are called, in Ephesians, to work alongside their husbands and to submit to them even when it is difficult. Why? Well, first of all, because that's how creation is set up, but also now because it reflects how the new Eve is called to relate to the new Adam. Submitting under difficult circumstances pictures how we all, as Jesus' people, must submit to him, even in the painful things that he sometimes calls us to. But you know what? I, we, often, we often emphasize that, and there's, there, there's good reason to do that, because that's something that's sort of uh, not liked in our culture, right? But we have to be careful, because I think 
it's actually husbands who have the far more daunting responsibility. Because Jesus has shown that what it means to be a king is to protect and care for your queen no matter what it costs, no matter how unworthy she is, no matter if it kills you. It is the man's responsibility to help his wife to flourish and to become the most beautiful person she can be. He is to do this. Why? Well, because that's how creation is set up. That's what a good queen king does for his queen. But also now, even more, because this reflects how the Messiah has laid down his life to get and to make beautiful the most unworthy of brides. This is what Ephesians 5 is all about. So there's a strange sense in which men have a special calling to be servants and a strange sense in which women have a special calling to be served. But maybe this isn't so strange because this is God's world in which we live and it is in Jesus that we see both God and humanity most clearly. So, this is, I think, the foundation, the framework that we need to think about sort of the more practical questions of male leadership in the church and the home, of wives submitting to their husbands, of um, women's roles in the church, right? Um, there are real differences in our roles. And uh, I'm not gonna go into, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with all this, the specifics of that because I think we have a pretty good sense of the practical parts of things. But um, I think what I wanna emphasize at this point is that it is only as we sort of have, keep that big picture, that big vision in mind, and as we live inside the Bible's story that we get those differences right, right? We have to remember that first and foremost, we are human, fellow heirs of the new creation. And then after that, we need to increasingly learn how to be kings and queens, taking our cues not only from our first parents, Adam and Eve, but from the new Adam and the new Eve that he's, that he's come for. So that's the foundation that I think must, 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 must keep in mind. And I think it's really beautiful. Do you see how gender roles, what sounds like an eye-rolling subject could actually, is actually, there's a lot more behind the scenes to it than we realize. It's kind of like, in a lot of ways, it's like if you wanted to learn how to, how to do some, how to do art or how to, how to paint or something like that. And you've never actually seen painting. And so someone tells you, okay, you gotta do this stroke this way, this stroke this way, this stroke this way. You're like, you're, you know, just like, eh, this is so boring. Why do I wanna do this? But if, you are, but if you have come to appreciate and love good art, then when you actually have to do the, 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 the sort of more detailed stuff, you're like, this is not just like a boring little details that I have to learn. This, I am becoming a painter. I am going to actually participate in making this beautiful art. And it's the same thing with this, with this topic. The, ba the details of gender roles that we hear talked about, it's not just these irrelevant details. It should be part of this beautiful dance that we're called to participate in. So some of you are like, okay, well, that was, that was interesting. Some of you are like, that was not interesting. But um, some of you are like, that was interesting. But it, the one rut that you, still, that you still remain in is that you're assuming the, the normality of marriage, that every, sort of this assumption that we have in our you know, conservative settings that everyone just needs to get married and that if you're not married, um, you're just something weird about you and that sort of thing. Nope, I'm not. Because the next section I want to talk about is how does this discussion of gender uh, relate to marriage versus singleness? And you're like, wow, okay. So singleness is, a, is something that maybe seems like it falls outside the purview of what we're talking about, male and female gender roles, because you think, well, that, that most naturally fits into sort of marriage discussions. But, but let's think about this, because if it's true that male and female and, and marriage reflects not only the way creation works, but reflects even bigger the way redemption works, then no matter who we are, there's a part that we play in that, in that drama of ultimate marriage, an ultimate male-female relation, right? So let's think about this. I wanna think about this for a few minutes. How does, so the New Testament, 
lifts up singleness as a noble and high calling, doesn't it? And there's that, you know, there's that passage, 1 Corinthians 7, that um, some of us have had a mixed history with. Like, some of us like it, some of us don't, some of us are just puzzled by it, right? So why do we, have, why do we struggle with that passage? Well, there's multiple reasons, right? One of them is obvious. But the other one is that we, uh, we sort of tend to assume and, and lift up marriage and biological family so highly that we don't really have much of a category for the New Testament's um, high place for singleness, right? So I think we need to think about that a little bit more. You know, in Genesis, the, when um, the man's living alone in the garden and God comes along and says what? He sees him alone and he says, this is not good, right? But the New Testament doesn't, doesn't seem to, to get, sound that same note, does it? Um, in fact, in, in the, all four Gospels, we meet the central figure of the New Testament, and in fact, the central figure in all of history, and he ends up being what? A single man. And far from calling people to marry and to be fruitful and multiply physically, Jesus is known for his statements about leaving parents and wife and family and property. He talks about becoming eunuchs for the kingdom of, of God. He talks about making disciples from all the nations. How does, that, how does that work? And then you have one of the other, the other big figures of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, and he also seems to have been single, right? And of course, he can speak very beautifully about marriage, like Ephesians 5 we were just talking about. And he definitely was not an ascetic. Like if you read 1 Timothy 4, he definitely did not think that marriage and sex were like evil or bad or something. He like basically curses people who do think that. Um, but he strongly encouraged believers to consider singlehood as a perfectly valid and even a wise choice. You know, there is something distinctly Christian about valuing singleness. It, this is something which sort of changed from the time of the Old Testament with the coming of Jesus. It was somewhat strange in, in Jesus' day, and it's still strange now uh, in our culture. In, the, in, in secular society, not so much but not really for good reasons, um, unfortunately. But <clears throat> there are two reasons, two things that have changed, two, two reasons that Paul gives for why singleness is a good option and a valuable thing and how actually singleness fits in to this whole beautiful dance of um, the great marriage between Messiah and his people. It's not something outside of that. It's, it's something within it. So first, singleness take seriously the difficulties of life and service in a, in a fallen, broken world. And secondly, singleness anticipates the new creation where human marriage is transcended by the marriage of Jesus and his people. So uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 7 just for a few minutes. So, Paul says in verse 25, concerning the, the betrothed or, or the virgins, um, I have no, I, he's saying, I have no command from the Lord, which means he's saying, I don't have a direct, there's no direct Jesus tradition for this. Like, there's not some word that's been passed down for what, like, something specific that Jesus himself said. He's not saying, this is my opinion, this is not, like, this is not inspired scripture, right? Um, thanks. He's saying, basically, hey, there's no, Jesus, I don't have a sort of a record of something Jesus said. But this is what I think. Um, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a woman to, for a person to remain as he is. So what does that mean in view of the present distress? Well, with Jesus' first coming um, came, this began what we call, what, what they called in, in, the, in Jewish times, the Jewish circles of Jesus' day, the, the last days, the end, of, the end of the age, right? And it was understood and expected that this time would be a time of 
great convulsions and what they often call the messianic woes, times of judgment and upheaval and stuff like that. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, God emphasized land, family, and material blessing, right? And, and those had always pointed forward to the ultimate blessing of God in a restored world with his people. So now, this day of fulfillment is coming, but it's kind of complicated because uh, it's coming, yes, but it's not fully here, right? So do you remember how Israel, um, before they went into the promised land, what did they, what happened to them first? They had like a lot of year, bad years in Egypt, right? A lot of very bad years in Egypt. Like if any of them heard me say that, they'd be like, yeah, that's an understatement, right? They, they were like hundreds of years in slavery. And then they go into the desert and then what? More bad years, right? Do you remember what happened to David after he was anointed king? Did he like have an inauguration and then sort of go into the White House? No, he, got, he basically got anointed and then gets chased around the, the, like the, the deserts for a couple of years, right? Well, just in the same way, Jesus and his followers are called to face a period of suffering and opposition before that final, the final glory, right? And so in this time of upheaval and of not being in our true home yet, and of, of waiting for that, for that day of deliverance. Um, it's not the time to feel overly rooted in land, family, and society. Marriage and family are obviously not wrong, and Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7, and he says that in other places. But there's a sense in which something about them better fits a settled time, in a, in a, a stable time in God's land, then it, uh, then it fits in a hostile world on the verge of destruction, right? And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 7. In view of the present distress of Christian life in a broken, evil world, this is also what he talks about in Romans 8, when he talks about the groaning that we and all creation face as we wait for the resurrection. Uh, he says, in view of that present distress, marriage is not the best option for everyone. Verse 29, he says, um, this is what I mean. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Those who mourn as though they were not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. Those who, had, who uh, buy as though they had no goods. Those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. In other words, your business ventures, your marriage and family, you better live in such a way that you remember that you're not ultimately rooted to any of those things. Because this is all about to about to pass away, and your ultimate home, your ultimate riches, your ultimate family is yet to come. So marriage is certainly perfectly acceptable, but Paul is saying that singleness can enable people to avoid any competing demands between the Lord and their spouses, and uh, the occasionally excruciating choices that that may, result, that may happen from that. Um, Single people also avoid the stresses, the anxieties, and the potential conflict that marriage can bring. They can instead pour all their energy into the things that are not about to pass away. So, the value and advantages of singlehood remind all Christians that our place in this broken world is temporary, that we must not settle down too much or root ourselves too deeply here. Our true home is yet to come. The church really needs godly single people who are intentional, who exemplify this attitude and continue to call all of us back from our nearly inevitable slide into complacency. And that, that's part of the way that single people, so married people can serve the church by reminding them of the great wedding that is to come. And single people can serve the church by reminding us that it hasn't come yet. Secondly, singleness also anticipates the, the ultimate marriage to come between the Messiah and his people. So think about this. Why was Jesus single? I, mean, I can think of various reasons, right? I mean, for one thing, he was only here until he was like 33. So, you know, it's like, well, what's the point, right? Um, then there's also the theological problems, right? Like what happens if a God-man has children? Like, you know, is that, that's just problematic. Um, 
However, the New Testament does not talk, does not emphasize any, either of those reasons, right? The New Testament, the picture of the New Testament, uh, the New Testament paints a picture of Jesus living as a single man because he was seeking, suffering for, and now awaiting his bride, all of us. So the valuing of singleness in the New Testament begins with the single Messiah awaiting the great marriage to come. And single believers likewise live out their and all of our anticipation of the great marriage in a very tangible way, right? Just like marriage is a, is a piece of divine theater pointing to the marriage of Jesus and his people, so singleness is a piece of divine theater pointed to that same day but in a different way. Jesus says in the resurrection, people don't marry. And as one of my professors like to say, um, we have the choice now to follow the pattern of the old creation and marry or to fo follow the pattern already of the new creation and, and when, the when our human marriage is eclipsed by the great one. In, in some ways, the theater that marriage and that a wedding is um, points to that, that great wedding day. But the, the piece of theater that singleness portrays is that picture of an engaged couple that's waiting for the day. And we need pictures of that too. So, when thinking about in the resurrection, they're not being marriage, um, it can seem at, in, in the sense that the absence of human marriage and sexuality in new creation is sort of a bummer, right? Um, it's like a, a real loss. But it's actually not. Because the commitment and devotion and companionship and sexual passion between the most loving husband and wife will be seen as little more than the, the, the faintest hints of, or, or flickers of light uh, in, in the ultimate sunrise. Marriage will not be lost it will actually be found. Single believers live as, though, as people who really truly believe that what they have not experienced in this life will indeed be experienced in a far greater and a far fuller way in the resurrection. That they, like Jesus and along with Jesus, are waiting. And that what they are waiting for along with Jesus is something really worth waiting for. And the, the church needs godly single people who embody this hope and continually call all of us, regardless of our marital status, to wait with them and with Jesus, to live in line with the age to come and the ultimate marriage that awaits. Jesus is still a human, and he's still a single human, waiting for us. So... Um, I'm gonna, before I move on, I, I just wanna get, talk about a couple of practical considerations. So all of you right now, sort of by definition, are single. Um, I, that's sort of the, the way it's defined that you can be here, right? Um, and, none, and yet none of you yet are singles, right? Um, so, but I want you, so some of you will wind up getting married within the next few years and some of you won't, right? And I want you to think about this practically because whatever you, your path winds up being, whatever calling God assigns you, there are some very practical um, ways in which you should be thinking about um, your calling and the, uh, the calling of your fellow believers in the church. So I, so I, I really regret the way that um, it's so easy for us to build structures that sort of default to and are built around sort of traditional family units. So we have like married people and kids, and then you've got like single people who are just like, and you're like, oh, where do you fit them? It's like, I don't know. We can like try to stuff you into the youth group, but and you're like, boing, right? It doesn't, doesn't, quite, <laughs> doesn't quite fit in that category. And you're like, let's put you in, let's put you over here. And you're like, ah, oh, so like, just, just go babysit the kids, right? So, you know, the, now here at Charity, I have been, much more happy, like I, 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 found it, I found things to be much more healthy than in many places. 
And I think we should um, really be thankful for to the, our elders and to the church culture in general for being significantly, uh, significantly better from uh, other places. But um, we all, I think, can talk about how the bizarre scenarios where, you know, you have like a youth group that goes on a trip and there's like a 21-year-old married couple that are the chaperones. And then there's like a 27 and a 28 year old youth that are in the group. Well, that's just, this is weird, right? This is clearly something wrong with this equation. As though you sort of by magic get mature when you get married, right? Um, this is not the case. Uh, it's often worse for single women because the way the systems are set up often single women never feel like they fully have a voice in the church. Um, and uh, and that, that, can be a, that can be a problem. So, I guess, I guess we should think about it this way. If a, 30, a certain 30-year-old man would, tr- would sort of kind of find his way into our church, named, I don't know, Jesus or something, would he feel like he fit in somewhere? And if he doesn't, I don't know, that just seems like problematic, deeply problematic, right? <laughs> so here, so it's important, it's so important that we embrace the New Testament's valuing of singleness and embrace all of our sisters and brothers in the calling that God has called them to. So here's a few practical things that I've thought of, and I want you guys to think, there's, there's probably way more that you can think of from here out. So first, have friends across marital status boundaries. Right? If you're now, some of you are going to, in a few years or soon, going to start dating and then shift into being married. That's a really, really good, that transition makes you a bridge between the world of the single people and the world of the married people. Right? And be, be intentional about not dropping your single friends and then like hanging out with a new crowd of newly married couples. Right? Um, oftentimes, if you're married, you have, obviously, you have a home and your single friends don't, so it's going to be a lot e- easier for you to do the hospitality. So do it. Like, intentionally invite, you know, stay connected with single, single people. Um, and try to bridge the, bridge the divide between the married and single. Bring, th- there should be an overlap in social, social circles. Secondly, judge people, judge single people and married people, not by their marital status, but by, as to echo Martin Luther King Jr., by the content of their character, right? Don't take someone more seriously just because they're married. Uh, me, you should, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that should be obvious, but unfortunately, it's not always very obvious. Like, and again, here I feel like I've been, it, it's been, uh, I think we have things a l- much, much, much healthier than in many places, but it's still something we all should keep in mind. And uh, don't ever take someone less seriously or think of them as less than fully legitimate just because they're single. So in short, don't treat single people differently than how you would want to treat a certain 30-year-old single man whose disciple you claim to be, right? And those of you who remain single, and even now, I mean, all of you are, um, don't fritter away away your time and freedom. Don't... um, But instead, be intentional. Seek to serve the church. Seek to embody that waiting and hoping that you are that you are representing in your in the calling God has you in. You can serve the church um, by the intentionality, the attitude you have, and by the way that you uh, that you reflect that single-minded devotion that that all of us need to be called to. Okay. Uh, Quickly, third and fourth. Appreciate the unique opportunities that single people have and the way their status points to the fleeting nature of all human marriage and the anticipation of the great marriage to come. Don't take advantage of single people uh, or treat them as resources to be used because they have extra time, right? But learn from them and be reminded of the things that their life embodies. And on the flip side, again, uh, single people don't, don't use your singleness to, uh, to shirk responsibility. Uh, but realize that your singleness, in a sense, gives you the obligation to, to have more responsibility, right, in, in some ways. Fourth, remember that all of our callings points in different ways to our present and future life in Jesus. The church needs both married and single people, rich and poor, old and young, male and female, but the church needs all these groups to recognize the unique contributions that they bring. 
And so um, we need to be purposeful in how our callings, married or single, point to the realities that all of us need to live by. Right? So. Okay. So. I want to just spend the concluding minutes here in trying to, trying to wrap this up by reflecting on a wedding. Um, because I think uh, this can tie in uh, all, of, all that we've been talking about so far. So let's think for a minute about a regular human wedding, okay? So most of us quite like weddings. We like going to them. They're beautiful, aren't they? And something about them we find moving. Uh, we often cry at weddings, don't we? But if you think about it, they're also kind of weird. Like, like, actually think about, like, just think about it. So a man and a woman decide to start a life together. But in order to do so, a woman has to wear a brand new solid white dress, which she's not allowed to wear again. And then the man has to wear, put on a special outfit too. And then they have to like invite certain special friends to stand next to them for some reason, right? And then, uh, then they invite all their family and friends to come and watch as the woman walks from the back of the church to the front of the church and uh, in her white costume, right? <laughs> and then for some reason or another, she's supposed to walk, her, her dad is supposed to like uh, walk her down despite the fact that she is, fully capable of walking from the back of the church to the front of the church by herself. And even weirder, the man that she's supposedly in love with and going to start her life just stands at the front, just like waiting for her. Right? And then, um, so then other, you know, other people who are dressed up, they give like little speeches and then they sing songs. And then the couple like holds hands or like, it's like this extended handshake. And, <laughs> and they recite these poetic sounding promises to each other. And then after this, both of them walk again from the front to the back, and the, the girl's dad is gone. Like, he seems irrelevant all of a sudden. <laughs> and then all the guests gather in a different room, and they eat a nice meal with pretty decorations. And then, oh, but even there, the man and the woman, and then those special friends who stood so next to them, they have to sit at a very a different table, a special table for some reason. Right? This whole thing seems almost like a play, doesn't it? Well, actually, that's because it is. Human weddings and marriages are a play. And they're a play which is meant to act out the great drama of divine love. And whether we are married or single ourselves, this is a play that we all have a part in and that we all need to pay attention to. As we saw earlier in this, our time together, Genesis 2 introduces the drama with the first the first recorded human words are being a love poem, right? This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then the author says, for this reason, a man ought to leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And a couple thousand years later, Paul is exhorting his readers on husband and wife, male and female relationships. And he says what? He quotes that verse in Genesis and then he adds something else. He says, this is a profound mystery. And what I'm saying is that it refers to the Messiah and his people. What Paul is saying is that the, the beginning of the Bible starts a story about marriage, which the end of the Bible says was actually quite mysteriously more profound than it seemed, right? And throughout the story of the Bible, marriage continues to play a deep, beautiful, and multi-layered role. Marriage is something that is to be celebrated, that is to be enjoyed, that is to be taken deathly seriously, that is to be felt very deeply. But it, it's also apparent that it is to be taken so seriously because it is one of the deepest ways that we can understand and feel a relationship far deeper still. So the book of Song of Solomon, you're like, uh oh. The, <laughs> the book of Song of Solomon is a long, unashamedly erotic love poem about the marriage between an idealized king of Israel and his beloved. It doesn't even seem to be about God at all, right? Like, it, but it's in the Bible. Why? Well, it's to show us that before we understand whatever it is that this faithful love, this commitment, the sexuality that marriage may represent, we first need to stop and hear and see and feel the beauty of what we witness at weddings. 
Why do people get emotional at weddings? Why is the mating of a man and a woman an occasion for such joy, but also the potential for such incredible heartbreak? Why is it so moving? It's because it is true. It is deeply true. It reflects a relationship that far transcends uh, itself. And we get hints of this in some of the Bible's darker stories and poems where marital unfaithfulness is evoked as God expresses anger and lament over the waywardness of his people. So Yahweh is Israel's husband who rescued his people out of slavery, took them to be his one special people, uh, and guided them, promised them his love, and gave them a beautiful land, right? But time and again, his people shamelessly cheated on him by going after other gods and not loving and being true to him. Because of this, the marriage was broken, And Israel was exiled into foreign lands, abandoned to the gods that they chased after, the gods that they, these are, uh, they are other lovers, essentially. But in this broken marriage of Yahweh and his people, we we read notes of of astonishing hope. So in the book of Hosea, God tells the prophet, with that name, um, to marry a woman who he said is going to be unfaithful to you. I mean, that's unfortunate, right? Um, so Hosea goes and marries this woman, Gomer, and the results are unsurprising. Gomer leaves him for other men, right? But then God tells Hosea to go take back Gomer to be his wife, even though he'd already gone through the heart, heartbreak and trauma of rejection and faith, unfaithfulness, right? And why? Well, God says this whole thing is a play to make the people of Israel see and feel that though they'd been unfaithful to their husband, yet he would take them back. Now, like, couldn't God have just said that without making this, this poor guy's life a roller coaster with this piece of live theater? No, because that's what marriage is. That's what marriage always is. It's a real life play that is the only way that we, by watching it in ourselves or others, can see and feel and know the seriousness of our rebellion against God the astounding wonder of what he wants his relationship with us to be and the lengths that he's willing to go to get there despite our unfaithfulness. So this brings us back to Paul's words in Ephesians 5. Paul writes that the mysterious meaningfulness of marriage has finally been brought to fulfillment in the Messiah, Jesus, dying for his people to make them his bride. In and through Jesus... God has gone to far greater lengths than anyone had dreamed he would, right? All we like sheep, and we could add like unfaithful spouses, have gone astray, but Yahweh has laid on him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. Jesus took upon himself the consequences, the judgment of his own people's cheating on him. How could that be, and why? Not so that they could go free, but so that he could present to himself his people as a bride, the most beautiful bride ever. There is a Hebrew word that ties all this together, the word chesed, which means something like faithful loyalty or loyal love. And it often refers to a covenant commitment where one party swears to be loyal and faithful to another party, to be there for them, to rescue them, to love them, and to uphold obligations for them. Um, Chesed is what Boaz showed Ruth when she came to take refuge under his protection, and he redeemed her. It's what God promised to show David when he said that his line, he would have an unending dynasty. Chesed is what marriage is all about. A man and a woman vowed to show faithful, loyal love to each other, no matter what, until death. In and through Jesus, God has shown his hesed to all of those who take refuge in the Messiah, as Jesus gave his life to redeem us. Paul says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And he doesn't give us his life and promise to be with us as a philanthropist or a sort of duty-bound relative, but with the joy of a groom at a wedding. And he calls us to to receive him, to trust him, to submit to him, to love him, not as law keepers or duty-bound children, but with the joy of a bride on her wedding day. 
That's what it means to be a Christian, and that's what we're called to. And he also calls us to wait. And this is where, this is where the, the incredible significance of single sisters and brothers is so important in this drama. Because God calls all of us to wait for this, for this coming day. And in a sense, the, this, the human marriage that married people have is going, to, is going to end. But on the day it ends is the day when the true marriage that all single people are especially pointing forward to by their lives begins. And in their calling, in your calling, in our calling, in the calling of, of our single sisters and brothers, they are exemplifying and, and show, in their piece of theater is to exemplify that joy-filled anticipation of an engaged couple. And that's what Jesus is doing right now. And that's what single sisters and brothers reflect in this play. And someday, all of us who are his people, married or single, male or female, will walk into the most joyous, glorious, exquisitely beautiful wedding that the greatest human weddings cannot, cannot reflect. And the mystery will then be fulfilled. And of that honeymoon, there will be no end. And until then, let us dance the dance that reflects that great day in our relationships as men and women, married and single. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of your word and for how the seemingly detailed and mundane and ordinary aspects of creation and of, of life and of uh, the pages of the New Testament reflect things that are so profound and beautiful that we don't fully understand, but that we love. Help us, Lord, to learn the steps that are our part in this dance. Help us as men to follow the example of the great new Adam. I pray for, uh, for the women that you will give them the, the grace to dance as uh, those who reflect the bride that we're all called to be part of. And I pray that all of us married or single will take our part in the drama that will someday be fulfilled. Amen.